tried to just entitle this prevent colon cancer. I mean, that's just what we need to get down to brass tacks. I've done this for 20 years. Forget all the trying to or strategies to. We're just going to prevent colon cancer. That's the, that's the goal. So the reason that this is such an important topic is if we look at what cancers kill Americans. In men, the number one cause of cancer death is lung cancer. In women, the number one cause of cancer death is breast cancer. But in both men and women, it's the second leading cause of cancer death. I have always tried to impart the wisdom that, yeah, it's the third most common cause of cancer death, but you're either a man or a woman, as most of us recognize. You either have lung as the top and colon as the second, or breast as the top and colon as the second. So it's the second leading cause of cancer death in men and women. It, it might be the third overall, but it's, it's the second because for, for, you're one gender or the other. And there are a tremendous number of new cases per year. Depending on how many procedures I will do per week, almost every week I see a new case of colon cancer. One a week. Makes me want to take vacation. Makes me want to leave in my, because it's, it, it's, a, it, it's just devastating when we find these. The vast majority are 65, 80, 75, and they're folks who have avoided skillfully through the years having a colonoscopy. They've made excuses, they have different reasons for not doing it, and they're anemic, they're losing weight, their bowels have changed, they're bleeding, and unfortunately we can see them from across the examining room. Oops, when was the last time you had your colonoscopy? Well, Dr. Trouble, I never had one. Those are the ones that really, uh, they, just, they just get us. But, but we do see folks that we find it early, and, and we, more importantly than anything else, we prevent colon cancer. I mean, this is gonna sound immodest, but in a busy practice, I probably prevent 30, 40 patients a week from ending up with colon cancer. People are living with the diagnosis of colon cancer that it might have already spread, but it's becoming more of a chronic disease. And there's wonderful hope that we can, we can keep this in remission and keep people from dying of it. If you look at the mortality, about the last 15, 20 years is when we start seeing a drop um, in uh, African Americans, as, not as much as in the rest of the population or Caucasian, but we are seeing a drop overall in this country, and it's because mainly of, of a test that we're gonna talk about called colonoscopy and some of the affiliated or associated tests, and it's mainly from taking out these precancerous growths called polyps, which is what we do 30, 40 patients a week. So we're gonna start talking, we're gonna talk a lot about about different strategies to prevent colon cancer. The heck with finding it early and treating it, we want to prevent it. And there are, there are treatment advances that are extending people's lives. Who's at risk? It's, it's 50 and older that we worry about for the most part. It's an equal gender cancer. It's essentially, you might read one study saying it's a little more in men, one study saying it's a little more in women, it's the same. It's an equal opportunity cancer from a gender standpoint, 50-50. So both men and women have the same risk. And there are some differences among certain groups, sometimes socioeconomic, sometimes depending on whether people get screened or don't get screened, with increased risks in African Americans, Alaska Natives, Ashkenazi Jews, and American Indians. But that's, that's not germane too much to our practice here in Fredericksburg. Basically we see a lot of colon cancer, as we all do in gastroenterology. There are some patients with a condition called ulcerative colitis, and ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory condition. One of the theories and one of the realities of cancer is if you have something that's upsetting something, if you have the sun upsetting the skin, you'll get skin cancer. If you have the gut upset by ulcerative colitis, you can get colon cancer, um, different things. But that's certainly a risk factor. It's not an uncommon illness, but it's not something that we see all the time either. There are some very rare syndromes that in my 21 years in practice in Fredericksburg, we have just a few patients, familial adenomatous polyposis. I have six families after 21 years 
that I keep a very close eye on with this thing called FAP or gardeners, that's out of 60,000 others. So it's, it's not a terribly common, common illness. There's a, a condition called Lynch family syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer and neoplasia. We'll, we'll um, test you on that afterwards, how to say that real quickly. But, but, but there are some folks with that. There are some people that can say, mom had colon cancer at age 50, or my brother showed up at age 45, that have early family histories and prominent family histories. But the vast majority of folks that we have to wake them up after the procedure and tell them, I'm sorry, we just found something that we need to treat called colon cancer, will say, well, nobody in my family ever had this before. Now, could it be that there was a family link that they didn't know about? Could it be that dad died in a car wreck at age 35 and passed that genetic on and never had a colonoscopy and that sort of thing? Sure, that, that definitely happens. So there are some, some risks for colon cancer, but the vast majority of folks are walking around the street and have no clue at age 50 and beyond that they have a significant risk for colon cancer. What we're looking for, and we're going to talk a lot more about colonoscopy in a bit, what we're looking for when we look with a lighted tube are these little growths called polyps. And there are two types. Hyperplastic means essentially nothing. We can manufacture a hyperplastic polyp just by doing little biopsies and, and sending it off to the pathology lab on almost anyone. And we gastroenterologists almost always know when it's hyperplastic and when it's the other type. The other type Adenomatous polyps are what causes 90% of colon cancer. Really, the only exceptions being things like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and some of these other family issues. I, I'm always intrigued by, by patients and, and doctors wanting to really cast it in the best light, and I don't blame them at all. As a patient today, I said, well, you've got a bunch of these adenomatous polyps, just like you had three years ago, and, um, and next time we're going to need to do it is five years. He said, they're benign, aren't they? I said, oh yeah, they're benign, but they're precancerous. Meaning, if we leave them in 10, 15, 20 years, almost every one of them would turn into cancer, but we never leave them in. We always take them out. So they are benign, but if we leave them in too long, that's what's going to grow into colon cancer. So if you will, normal tissue, whether we know it or not, has obviously per square centimeter, has millions of cells. And if there are some cells in here that are not normal, that are predisposed towards trying to genetically grow out of proportion, go haywire, they can eventually stack up and form this growth called a polyp. And this is what we want to find. When they're on a stalk like this, it's nice to find them. It's like chopping down a tree. You can just chop it down and it's gone. And we want to just plain take out these precancerous polyps. And if by misfortune we find someone who has already developed cancer, we'd much rather find it early than late. If we find it early, 90% of the time, people are fine. There are different stages, but just say a low-grade stage, found it early, this is not spread. 90% of the time, surgery will be curative or even endoscopy and taking it out that way. And that's, if we have to find a cancer, that's the one we want to find. Unfortunately, when people have symptoms, 90% of the time, it's already spread. When people come in with symptoms, it's, it's often spread and they have lymph nodes, they have tumor in the liver, they have tumor <coughs> elsewhere, and we'd much rather find early cancer than late cancer. How often in a 50, 51, 54 year old do we find colon cancers when we're just doing routine colonoscopy for screening? Not too often. Sometimes. Maybe once a month. I might do 150, a couple hundred colonoscopies a month. I might find one that's a 50 year old gentleman or lady who just came in for screening. Unfortunately, most of the people that, are, that we find with colon cancers are 65, 75, 85, and they've put it off and never had this test. So that's why we try to get people screened. Unfortunately, at this point, maybe 55, maybe 60% of Americans over the age of 50 who need this 
have had it done. Now, when I gave this lecture, this is great hope, when I gave this lecture 15 years ago, I could quite honestly say to the folks in the audience, only 15 or 20 percent of you have had the, right, have had the test done. It's <coughs> gradually going up, and as you saw in the previous graph, the, the death rate from colon cancer is gradually going down. They're directly proportional. The more people we can see and, and screen and take out polyps, the more people will prevent colon cancer. So there's a slow but steady improvement. Does it take time? Does it cost? Yes. I mean, it takes a day out of your life to get this done. It does cost. You do have to have family or friends drive you, so it's a day out of their life or their work situation. So what are some screening guidelines? This is evolving. It's actually evolved recently. This slide set was from 2011 from the American Cancer Society, and it's even just taken another twist in the last week or two. The GI societies, the radiology societies, the cancer society all have parts and words to say about the screening. But what we know is if we can detect and remove precancerous polyps and somehow take these out, then that's going to affect the rate of death from colon cancer more than anything else. Other ways that hit at it to try to find these things, to try to find some blood, they're indirect tests that do something much better than nothing. The Freelance Star years ago quoted the, gosh, it must have been, <laughs> again, I'm dating myself, it must have been 10 or 15 years ago when we were first starting to do something called virtual colonoscopy, and we're going to talk about that a bit more, which is an x-ray exam of the colon um, with the CAT scan. It's not as good as colonoscopy, but if you'll do nothing else, please do something rather than nothing. And we have to, have to keep, keep our eye on the ball and try to do that. So computed tomographic colonoscopy or virtual colonoscopy is something that is out there. I order about six a year. And there's a neat stool test that sounds great to find who's shedding the genetically abnormal DNA from colon cancer. Sounds great. I'm amused at some of my charts from 1992 when I put in bold handwriting. I've told this patient that within a few years we should have a genetic test and she won't need a colonoscopy next time. Well, here we are 20 years later and we still don't have a great genetic test. This genetic test is 60% accurate. It's getting better as we identify more of the abnormal genes, but it's still 60%. 60 percent. 60 percent is not quite good enough for human medicine. It's just not something we believe in. And so these guidelines um, are, t we, we have all kinds of things that we can, we can recommend. Flexig, which is a short lighted tube test. It looks at essentially a third or a half of the colon. And again, maybe somewhat sacrilegious or irreverent, I tell people that that's the same as telling ladies to prevent breast cancer by having a mammogram of the left breast. I mean, it's a halfway test. Nobody wants to do a halfway test. We, we hardly ever do this anymore. Colonoscopy, every 10 years for the general public, is absolutely the standard of care in our opinion. An x-ray has to, if we're going to recommend very minima or virtual colonoscopy, we have to have a pretty good reason to tell the insurance company to do this because the insurance companies wisely know that you pay now or you pay later, they are much more eager to have colonoscopy performed because it prevents a $250,000 surgery, chemo, radiation treatment of colon cancer, which sometimes doesn't work. So it is absolutely something that we can recommend these x-rays, but we do it for reasons of patients being afraid of a colonoscopy or something else. And then these other tests with stool tests for blood and a specialized stool tests for blood are out there. This one just has gotten a little bit better rating and it's starting to become on the radar that it might be pretty good at, at screening large populations that maybe don't have access to gastroenterologists. So there, there are things out there that are, are um, looking, we're, we're looking at all this. Why don't we recommend colonoscopy for everybody? We know that we can cause a hole in the colon the textbook again says one out of a thousand patients, and again, those data are always from university centers because they have enough people and enough doctors doing procedures they can get the numbers up. And they're mostly junior gastroenterologists that don't do this very often. The real world 
is more like one out of 2,000, one out of 5,000, one out of 10,000. And, and, and I would encourage anyone to ask their gastroenterologist, how many of these have you done and how many perforations have you had? 60,000 and six. I don't have any, any hesitancy telling people that, it's true. And we perforate people when we take out large polyps or small cancers. I do that 10 times a week. Why does that one out of 10,000 patients get perforated, but not the other 9,990? I don't have a clue. So I don't blame anybody for being anxious about it and we'll talk about it. And then a lot of patients want to have something else done that's not as obnoxious as what we do. As my mother said years ago, and she was up in her 80s, and she said, son, she was in a nursing home, my friends and I aren't real keen on your type of doctor. We kind of, we're not real, they're not our favorite doctors. I say, I know mother, but we do a good job. And, 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 and it's, it's not something that people maybe want to kind of come flooding to see us, and I don't blame them, but it's something we really can, can fix. What colonoscopy is, is a long, flexible, lighted tube, and it's the technology, and, and again, 20 some years has advanced. Almost every few years we get new equipment, better technology. We do use a camera, and it has high definition now. We can see incredible things that we couldn't see 20 years ago. There's a, um, a little flushing or irrigation channel we can put water through. We have a great light source that we can see things, otherwise it's pretty dark in there. And the instrument channel allows us to put in little instruments to remove polyps or burn lesions or or, or fix um, or, or put injections of medicines in different spots. So, so the colonoscopy, by definition, what we are trying to do is look at every square inch of the colon. 100% from where the appendix is and where it joins the small bowel, inch by inch by inch. What I tell patients, again, a couple times, dozen times a day is, this is a lighted tube test. We were going to get you very sleepy so you don't have pains or discomfort or remember this even because we don't want to make it difficult for anybody. And, and, and what I often tell people in a joking fashion, and it's true, we want you to come back. If you have something bad, we don't want you to have some anxiety about having it a second time. We don't want you to be fearful of it. And that's very important. And so we all encourage and use sedation. And then we use that light it to, to get to the cecum, the end of the colon, takes about five minutes. But we take 10 or 15 or 20 minutes to methodically, inch by inch by inch, march ourselves backwards through the lining of the colon. We actually turn the scope backwards on itself to look behind these folds, around corners, suctioning out little <coughs> debris and particles that are in there, flushing some of the, the, the um, some of the mucus and debris that's inside the colon. And then by that means, we can get a great look at every square inch of the colon. We probably miss one or two percent of small little growths that are on the other side of folds. But if it's a big growth, we're gonna see it and we're gonna remove it. So colonoscopy is both a diagnostic test, we find polyps and cancer, and it's a therapeutic test, it fixes the colon, if you will. It restores it back to its pristine health. We get rid of all those little growths, and that way we reset the clock, and, and we know that we bought ourselves three years, five years, 10 years before we need to look again.